<laughs> can't do that. Yeah. It worked fine then. We'll now welcome our second panel of witnesses. Thank you both for being here. Nancy Stoner is Acting Assistant Administrator for Water of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and then Mr. Mike Poole is Acting Director of the U.S. Bureau of Land Management as of tomorrow. Uh, so this is your, we're breaking you in officially. We'll try to be done before you're actually placed as Acting Administrator. Is that all right? Uh, try to finish today. As I mentioned, everyone, we do have votes that will be called shortly. And uh, so we will try to get in both your testimony and deal with questions as we go. With that, Ms. Stoner, we would be glad to receive your testimony. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Langford and Ranking Member Connolly and members of the subcommittee. I'm Nancy Stoner, Acting Assistant Administrator for Water at US EPA. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. Ms. Stoner, I apologize so much for this. I did not swear everyone in. So, oh, okay. Sorry, every, every hearing has to have some swearing in it. And, uh, <laughs> so if I could ask both of you to please stand so we can swear you in. That is pursuant to committee rules on that. I apologize for that. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in an affirmative. I apologize for having to stall you there in the moment. You can start all over again or pick up where you left off. I, I, that's okay. I think I'll pick up right where I stopped. The EPA and this administration recognize that natural gas represents an important energy resource for, the, for our country. Increased reliance on gas has the potential to create jobs, promote energy security, lower energy prices, and reduce harmful emissions to air and water. At the same time, the administration is committed to ensuring the production proceeds in a safe and responsible manner. We firmly believe we can protect the health of American families and communities while enjoying the benefits of expanded national energy reserves. While states are the primary regulators of onshore oil and gas activities, the Federal Government has an important role to play by regulating oil and gas activities on public and Indian trust lands, research and development aimed at innovation to improve the safety of natural gas development and transportation activities, and setting sensible, cost-effective public health and environmental standards to implement Federal laws and complement State safeguards. As the Senior Policy Manager for EPA's National Water Program, I would like to highlight a few of the EPA's recent actions under the Safe Drinking Water Act and Clean Water Act intended to ensure that natural gas production can remain protective of human health and the environment. The Safe Drinking Water Act governs the construction, operation, permitting, and closure of underground injection wells for the protection of under, underground sources of drinking water. Underground injection control, or UIC, programs administered by EPA or the States are responsible for overseeing these injection activities. However, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 excludes hydraulic fracturing from regulation under EPA's UIC program, except when diesel fuels are used in fluids or propping agents. The EPA has heard from both industry and the public that we should clarify the applicability of the permitting requirement for diesel fuels hydraulic fracturing, as well as how those permits should be written. In response, and in light of the significant increase in natural gas production in the United States, we have developed draft guidance to clarify requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act and to help prevent the endangerment of underground sources of drinking water from hydraulic fracturing using diesel fuels. The EPA developed this draft guidance with input from industry, states, tribes, and other Federal departments and agencies, environmental organizations, and the public. I would like to emphasize that, as is the case with all guidance, the draft document does not impose any new requirements. The draft clarifies existing statutory and regulatory requirements and provides technical recommendations for applying UIC Class II requirements to the diesel fuels hydraulic fracturing process. The guidance is intended for use by EPA permit writers under the UIC program and will be applicable where EPA is directly responsible for the UIC Class II program. We are taking public comments on the draft through July 9th and welcome comments from all affected parties and the public. The agency has also initiated efforts under the Clean Water Act to provide regulatory clarity and protection against risks to water quality. In October 2011, EPA announced a schedule to develop pretreatment standards for wastewater dischargers 
discharges produced by natural gas extraction from underground coal bed and shale formations. In addition, EPA is assisting State and Federal permitting authorities in the Marcellus Shale region by answering technical questions concerning the treatment and disposal of wastewater from shale gas extraction. The EPA has also been conducting research to better understand the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water resources, and that is through our Office of Research and Development. In conclusion, EPA's activities related to hydraulic fracturing help assure that public health and water quality remain protected as natural gas helps to promote our Nation's economic recovery and security. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I am happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Poole. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Bureau of Land Management's development of hydraulic fracturing rules and their application on Federal and Tribal Trust lands. The BLM administers over 245 million acres of, of surface estate and approximately 700 million acres of onshore Federal mineral estate throughout the Nation. Together with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we also provide permitting and oversight services on approximately 56 million acres of Indian Trust minerals. Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar has emphasized that as we move forward the new energy frontier, the development of conventional energy resources from BLM managed public lands will continue to play a crucial role in meeting the Nation's energy needs. Facilitating the safe, responsible, and efficient development of these domestic oil and gas resources is the BLM's responsibility and part of the Administration's broad energy strategy to protect consumers and help reduce our dependence on foreign oil. In fiscal year 2011, onshore Federal oil and gas royalties exceeded $2.7 billion, approximately half of which was paid directly to the States in which the development occurred. Tribal oil and gas royalties exceeded $400 million, with 100 percent of those revenues paid to, to the Tribes and individual Indians owning the land on which the development occurred. Oil and gas production from shell formations scattered across the United States has grown considerably and is expected to continue in coming decades. Factors contributing to this success include technological advances in hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. The BLM estimates that approximately 90 percent of the wells drilled on public lands and Indian lands are stimulated by hydra hydraulic fracturing techniques. The increasing use of hydraulic fracturing has raised public concerns about the potential impact on water availability and quality particularly with respect to the chemical composition of fracturing fluids and the methods used. The BLM recognizes that some, but not all, states have recently taken action to address hydraulic fracturing in their own regulations. One of the BLM's key goals in updating its regulations on hydraulic fracturing is to complement these state efforts by providing a consistent standard across all public and Indian lands. The agency has a long history of working cooperatively with state regulators to coordinate state and federal activities. The proposed rulemaking is not intended to duplicate various state or applicable federal requirements. The BLM's intent is to encourage efficiency in the collection of data and the reporting of information. The development of this hydraulic fracturing rule includes tribal consultation and the Department's consultation policy. This policy emphasizes trust, respect, and shared responsibility by providing tribal governments an expanded role to inform Federal policy that impacts Indian lands. In January of 2012, the BLM conducted a series of meetings in the West where there is significant development in Indian oil and gas resources. Nearly 180 tribal leaders were invited to attend these meetings held in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Billings, Montana, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Farmington, New Mexico. Eighty-four tribal members representing 24 tribes attended these meetings. On May 11, 2012, the BLM sent over 180 invitations for continued government-to-government -government consultation to exchange information on the development of hydraulic fracturing rule. As the agency continues to control with tribal leaders throughout the rulemaking processes, responses from these representatives will inform our actions and define the scope of the accept acceptable hydraulic fracturing rule options. The BLM's proposed rule is consistent with the American Petroleum Institute's guideline for well construction and integrity. On May 11, 2012, the BLM published the proposed rule in the Federal Register beginning a 60-day public comment period. Straightforward measures outlined 
outlined in the proposed rule include disclosure of chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing operations with appropriate protections for trade secrets, assurance of a wellbore integrity to minimize the risk of fracturing fluids leaking into the nearby aquifers, and water management requirements to apply to the fluids that flow back to the surface after hydraulic fracturing has taken place. The hydraulic fracturing proposed rule will strengthen the requirements for hydraulic fracturing performed on federal and Indian trust lands in order to build public confidence and protect the health of American communities while ensuring continued access to important resources that make our energy economy. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And thank you not only for your written testimony, but your oral testimony and for allowing you to come in on your pre-first day on it. We are verifying right now, I think they may be calling the votes. Uh, if they are calling the votes right now, that is going to interrupt our schedule on it. Uh, to be able to see. And so I don't want us to jump into our questioning time uh, if we call the votes on it. So if we'll just hesitate for just a moment and see if they're about to do that. Okay. We'll try this a couple different ways. Uh, it looks like they are calling the vote on that. If they are, then we can do a round of questions and then come back and do a second round, uh, or we can try to stall and do both rounds when we are back. So we can really take this either way. So we are going to pretend this is a democracy for a moment and just talk <laughs> about it. Um, if, if you wanted, Mr. Chairman, maybe we don't take our full five minutes, but to, in, in order to get some questions in and then come back. And come back around. Yeah. Mr. Kelly, you are all right with that? We will try to do maybe three minutes in this first round and then come back and do a, a second round. So we will do three minutes in the first round on it, and then the second round we will do like 18 minutes each or something like that. <laughs> so let us try to do that. We will we'll try to cover through a few of these things so we can, we can get going on this, because we want to honor you all's time as well. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Let me yield to uh, Mr. Kelly uh, here at this first moment here and with my round of questionings on it. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, you know, uh, Ms. Stoner, I'm trying to understand uh, the, the, the change in EPA's interpretation of, re of, of a regulation and why was the 2010 subject not, uh, announcement not subject to the, the notice and comment procedure. And I'm talk talking specifically when we go into the, the diesel uh, element of it. There, there was, uh, that was kind of fast paced, was it not? It was just placed on your website. There wasn't really a, the, the regular procedure taken? Uh, so this is a guidance document. So it, uh, it is an interpretation of the statute and the regulations. It imposes yeah, no but, but I'm talking about actually before the guidance document. I, I'm sorry. Are you not talking EPA, about the EPA But EPA posted it on their, on their website, it, on, the, on the permit for a, with the diesel, using the diesel in the, in the fracking. Yeah, no. The EPA has on its website information about what is in the Energy Policy Act, including the fact that when hydraulic fracturing is done with diesel fuels, a permit is required. That is in the statute. Uh, and, uh, and so we did in, include that information on our website. Uh, as you may know, uh, we did have a lawsuit associated with that, uh, which has now been settled. And I understand, but that is different than the document that existed before the 2010. Is that, is that not true? You, you, it is changed. Um, I am not sure that I understand your question. Well, there is a letter from Acting Assistant Administrator Ben Grumbles for the State, uh, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee stating that the use of hydraulic fracturing using diesel does not fall within the scope of the UIC Class II program. Now, I, was that that's before 2010. Was that before 2005, no, Congressman? That goes, no, that is before the 2010. So the EPA then decides to change that. And just going on their website and saying it, there was, it, it didn't go through the normal processing, is what I'm saying. Uh, it's not my understanding that the agency changed uh, its position between 2001 and 2005. Okay. In 2001, we, we, uh, there was a court decision that said that hydraulic fracturing uh, was within the Class II UIC program. Okay. It was at that point that the agency uh, changed his position in response to a and, federal And I understand court. it. I am going to say, with, without objection, Mr. Chairman, I am going to ask that this, uh, this letter be put in to the testimony. Uh, without objection. Okay. 
And I think the concern is that things change rather, rather quickly and that a process then all of a sudden that was not policy before becomes policy and does not go through the regular process. And the diesel fra the fracturing was not part of what was, was in the policy, with using diesel fuel. And all of a sudden, it did become part of it. Right. We are implementing the 2005 uh, statute uh, with the guidance that has uh, gone through, uh, going through public notice and comment now after a series of public meetings and discussions with a variety of different groups. So we are undertaking that process. We agree with you that it is important to have uh, the involvement and, and a wide variety of uh, partners and stakeholders in the process. And I understand that that is the the intent of the whole process, and that's why I wonder why was it fast tracked like that. No, Mr. Chairman, my time is up, and I'm yield back. I recognize Mr. Connolly. I've lost nine seconds. Sorry. Um, Welcome to both of our panels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to clarify, I am confused. Uh, EPA is not proposing a general broad regulation of fracturing. It is only proposing fracturing within the statutory uh, framework provided in the 2005 legislation and a subsequent court ruling. Is that correct, Ms. Stoner? Uh, yes, that is correct. We are interpreting the statute and the regulations. But it, but if, for example, it does not involve diesel, you are not regulating the process. That is correct. Diesel fuels is in the statute. That is what we are implementing. Uh, Congress imposed the obligation on uh, hydraulic fracturing operations using diesel fuels uh, to obtain a permit, and the guidance explains how to do that. And, and uh, this assertion of regulatory responsibility in this particular lane involving diesel uh, was actually uh, insisted upon, is that correct, or ruled upon by a court? Uh, the court uh, determined that hydraulic fracturing was covered under the UIC Class II program. Uh, that was in 2001. Congress took action in 2005 uh, that limited that permitting requirement only to hydraulic fracturing using diesel fuel. And so what the guidance, proposed guidance does is indicate how that should be implemented. Why did it take seven years from that legislation to today to get around to proposed regulations? Uh, it, the, uh, the, what we did initially at the EPA was a memo, uh, memorandum of agreement with uh, companies involved in coal bed methane. Uh, hydraulic fracturing, indicating that they would not use diesel fuels. And what's happened is a shift in the industry so that there is now more hydraulic fracturing uh, that's outside that realm of the coal bed methane. And that's why the initial steps we took we no longer view as uh, sufficient to comply with what Congress asked us to do. Hmm. Um, are you aware of any cases where fracturing has come to a, a halt because of your pending regulatory um, rules? Uh, no, I am not aware of any. You are also proposing as uh, an emission to uh, regulate carcinogens, benzene, and volatile organic compounds, but not methane. Is that correct? Uh, that would be an air rule that you are asking me about. I am yes. afraid I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but you're not, but, so you don't know the answer as to whether or not, my understanding is you are not proposing anything with respect to methane. I am sorry, I don't know the answer. We could submit that information. Well, you, you will recall doc, uh, uh, earlier the professor's testimony that methane actually is a very serious concern of his uh, and other academics looking at, as scientists looking at fracturing. And the reason is because it is part of a family of organic compounds. Methane in and of itself may not be dangerous, but it is a precursor to benzene and other carcinogens. And, all right. Um, Mr. Poole, uh, did you hear Mr. McKee's testimony from Uinta, uh, Utah? Yes, I did. He testified that essentially BLM, being the owner of 59 percent of the land mass in his county, uh, is really putting the crimp on their style in terms of the ability to exploit natural resources uh, because uh, it is federally owned land and federally controlled land. Would you comment? And I know you're first, first day in this particular set of responsibilities. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. That's a very prolific region, region in terms of uh, natural gas uh, potential and development. And we've issued 
uh, quite a few leases up there, and we've issued quite a few APDs. Um, I think when it comes to leasing federal land, we have other important responsibilities that we have to address in terms of biological and cultural considerations. And so when we go into a leasing process or we go into a full development process, we need to work with the operators. And these jurisdictions will vary depending on the sensitivity of these resources. Um, I know between, I think between Wyoming and Utah, we, well, we have about 6,800 6, APDs, that what we call front log, that we've, we've issued the APDs, but the companies have not taken the action to activate those. And I, and I think there's a percentage of those in Uinta County, and I, and I don't have that exact number. Well, but the, but the, the testimony, essentially, the thrust of the testimony from the, at least two of the state regulators or, or officials was, we don't need no stinking federal government. Why not just let, for example, in this case, Utah? regulate what happens in BLM land. What's wrong with that? Well, I mean, as it relates to hydrologic uh, fracturing or fracking, um, what we discovered in review of our own regulations, they were very outdated. Many of the states, uh, including Colorado, Wyoming, Texas, Arkansas, were starting to develop regulatory procedures to address uh, various requirements associated with fracking. And so we we looked at our regulations. I think the Secretary of Interior has done an incredible job in terms of public outreach with his forum he held in D.C. back in uh, the fall of 2011. Subsequently, we held regional meetings. Um, we got recommendations from the Secretary of Energy's uh, Natural Gas Subcommittee, all of which was helping the BLM kind of formulate what improved standards should we develop and we really look closely at what the state regulators have been doing. In many cases, they've been out in front of the BLM. The issue is there that the state fracking regulations don't pertain to federal lands. And in many provinces of the West, we'll have fee land, we've got state land, and we've got public land. And so we would like to think with the, the development of our proposed rule with a, a high degree of outreach and public input, and that's still ongoing uh, during the comment period, that, uh, that our regulations will be uh, very much complementary to and very much in alignment with what the states are doing as well. It's very important they be in line. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Mr. Poole, let me ask you about that. The, uh, the, the public lands, you're saying the state rules would not apply. So you're saying state regulations in Utah would not apply to fracking? On that is correct. There is, was there a consideration to say that they would, or is there a need for BLM to create a whole new group of regulators and now go in and evaluate this? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I mean, our authorities come under these two principal statutes, the Mineral Leasing Act and the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. Um, and so our regulations have to be basically developed under those two statutes for us to enforce whatever requirements that we want to impose so, on the operators. So you had mentioned before that your regulations are very out of date on this. Obviously, states keep theirs very up to date. That's correct. Is there a process in place where BLM is going to keep up to date on all the different states? We, we, our goal is to, in developing our proposed rule, we've, 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 we looked at Colorado, we've looked at Wyoming, we did look at Texas, we've even looked at Arkansas, and we We've taken into account some of the standards that they've developed over a period of time, and um, and we're using their information along with, you know, more recent public information to finalize our rule. Well, the, just one thing, I'm going to I'd like to add, have unanimous consent to add to the record a letter from the governor of Wyoming uh, mentioning about this, saying that he feels like the rules are very duplicative to what they already do in Wyoming, and this is going to create two different sets, and, and a little bit of frustration with that. So I'd like to be able to add that to the record as well. Let me. Let me ask a couple of questions because we're going to be limited on time. They have called the votes now. I want to be able to honor your time as well. How long will this process add, you think, this new additional set of regulations to the permitting process? So how many days do you think it will add? You know, I don't have exact days, but I think the requirements uh, somewhat, somewhat I think they're very, uh, they're very basic. Um, you know, in terms of the constituents or chemicals used, which primarily in many cases are water sand based solution. We're asking the companies, after they complete the fracking operation, to file that information to us within the, 30 days. The reason I ask is this morning in testimony that we heard, uh, there was an estimate given that this would add up to 100 days in the process. And I didn't know if you all had set an estimate on that as well. Uh, I don't have it with me today, but we would be glad to provide that. Let, let, me, let me ask a couple of questions as well. Ms. Stoner, the, my concern is on the expanded definition of diesel. It is very clear that diesel fuels is included in the 2005. 
Uh, but if I, if I drove a diesel truck, which I don't, if I drove a diesel truck and then poured kerosene into it, it I would not consider that a diesel fuel. Uh, if I drove a diesel truck and I pulled up and instead of filling it up with diesel, I instead put crude oil in there uh, or home heating oil in there, it would not run uh, because it is a diesel vehicle on that. And it, the, the definition is fairly clear. It is diesel fuels. The new expanded definition of diesel fuels appears, and that is what I want us to have a dialogue about. Uh, many of the uh, companies that are doing fracking saw the ruling in 2005, saw the, the statement from Congress saying that diesel f fuels will be regulated, and so they shifted away from diesel fuel. And this has the perception that because they no longer use diesel fuels, we have to redefine what is a diesel fuel to make sure that what they are using is included. Does that make sense? So crude oil, home heating oil, kerosene, how are those now suddenly diesel fuels? So in the Energy Pol Policy Act of 2005, the term diesel fuels appears, but there is no definition. Correct. So uh, this is the first attempt the agency has made to provide such a definition. It did so by uh, looking at six chemical abstract service or CAS numbers. There are six of them, very Correct. specific things, all of which are diesel fuels. Diesel fuel number one, diesel fuel number two, diesel fuel But they are they're diesel fuel number one, two, three, as designated by who? By EPA or by some other group? Because, for instance, petroleum distillates, that, that could be just about anything that is a petroleum product. It has got a specific CAS number not, that doesn't come from the agency. It is called crude oil slash diesel fuel. Kerosene is marine diesel fuel. So all six of them are diesel fuel. And that is where we got the six CAS numbers from, is from that. Uh, and so that is where uh, we, our proposed definition, we are uh, taking comment on that. We feel like it is a very clear definition because it links specifically to those six CAS numbers. Um, I, I, I'm second guessing whether Congress in 2005, of course I was not in Congress in 2005, none of us were on this panel were, uh, but I'm second guessing where Congress in 2005 was considering crude oil a diesel fuel or as broad as petroleum distillates as a diesel fuel. Uh, that's a very broad definition. And uh, that is the concern there, that this suddenly seems to reach out with a net and to be able to snag everything in it. Uh, one of the quick comment, then I want to get a chance to share uh, some additional time here. Why the redefining now, why BLM putting in the new regulatory environment now before EPA has finished its study? We have a study due in just a few months to define whether there is even a problem. We just created a new series of regulations. We have just greatly expanded what diesel fuels pertains to the common sense view of what is a diesel fuel in the past before EPA finalizes a study? Uh, the um, ORD study will actually uh, take uh, a couple more years. We expect to have progress this year, but not a final report this year. The, do, the information we do have about what Congress uh, did in terms of diesel fuels was, was that Congress was focused on benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene or BTEX compounds, which are associated with all six of those CAS numbers. So we are uh, doing our best to interpret what Congress was concerned about in terms of chemicals in underground sources of drinking water, the potential risks there. And uh, that is our proposed uh, uh, description of diesel fuels. And again, it is out for public comment. Will this be retroactive permitting? when the new definition is done? Uh, it, uh, the permitting re requirements of the statute and the regulations apply now, but the diesel fuel definition is a proposed uh, interpretation of those would, of course, not be. So if a state doesn't abide by the guidelines, will they lose primacy in this? Uh, we don't intend to uh, uh, take away primacy from our state partners. We work closely with them on implementing these programs in a complementary way uh, and uh, don't intend to do that. Uh, the draft guidance applies only uh, to those states where EPA is the permitting authority under the UIC program. Uh, would, this, would this be mandatory in the BLM area? It, it, it doesn't apply. It doesn't differentiate between private lands and federal lands, but it does apply only where EPA is the, is the issuing permitting authority for UIC. States uh, assume that authority. Uh, many states like Oklahoma have assumed that authority, and it does not apply uh, to those states, although they may find it useful.
Mr. Poole, obviously that would be your decision to make in the, in the days to come on whether BLM, uh, this applies in all those areas of guidance. I need to give two additional minutes back to Mr. Kelly, uh, who only got three here. Okay, and I thank the Chairman. Uh, Ms. Stoner, uh, two things, and I'm going to ask you one of them, and very quickly, Mr. Poole. Uh, and the reason I ask is because of Pennsylvania, Dimmick PA, and, and I think you're familiar with the movie Gasland. Yes? I'm sorry, familiar with what, sir? The, the movie Gasland? Gasland. Yes. I am it's, somewhat familiar with Okay. Uh, on May 11th, Roy Seneca, who is a spokesman for the regional EPA office, he said, now, they, they tested 59 wells in Dimmick and found that the fracking had nothing to do with any contamination of the water. And he says, this set of sampling did not show levels of contaminants that would give the EPA reason to take further action. So then the conclusion would be then that the EPA doesn't need to be concerned anymore with Dimmick PA, with the testing, so the water is safe and it is not a result of fracturing. There is nothing that has been contaminated. My understanding is that there is some limited additional sampling occurring to verify that there is no public health concern, but that uh, we have not found a public health concern to date. Okay. So all the testing has turned up nothing that would be determined that the water was affected by fracking. That is to your spokesman. Uh, my understanding is that we believe nothing required further action. That's okay, correct. so then that's a settled issue. Now, Mr. Poole, uh, and the President talks an awful lot about the increase in, in oil and gas. Where has the increase taken place? Has it taken place in the, in the Federal lands or where has it taken place? Well, I, I think the BLM and the public lands we manage is a, is a major contributor to the production of natural gas and oil. I mean, currently we have about 85,000 producing wells in public lands, about 90 percent of which we do apply hydrologic fracturing to maximize the economic recovery of the resource. Um, but when we talk about the increase, and there has been a huge increase, but most of it has taken place in the private sector. It has not taken place, 96 percent of it, by the way. We have a slide that shows that. I mean, hey, look at this. So if we are talking about and the President is saying, wow, I mean, look what we have done. But 96 percent of it, the increase in U.S. oil production since 1977 has, has occurred on non-Federal lands. So this really has nothing to do with the administration. Well, as I mentioned in my earlier comments, that we have a variety of statutes that we have to address when we offer uh, plans plans for lease. And um, in recent years, we have been much more measured. Is this, was this chart, do you think this chart is correct? Congressman, I, I can't confirm It is a CRS uh, chart, by the way. Okay. Okay. I, I, I have, and I know this is your first day, but I am trying to determine, because I am hearing all the time about this tremendous increase under this administration. And the fact of the matter is, it really has happened in the private sector. It hasn't happened on Federal lands. So I, I think it's just sometimes you have to clear those things up so that people actually understand what this, where, what's going on. And I, we talked earlier. It, it, I just have a problem with people who take credit for things that they didn't have anything to do with. Uh, and I think that the general public it never sees these things. And when they hear these numbers, they say, oh, my goodness, this is incredible what's happened. It's happened through the private sector. It has not happened on Federal lands. And I think that when you look at it, 96 percent has, ha has happened in the private sector. It did not happen, 4 percent in Federal. So where there would have been some influence, it absolutely had nothing to do with it. And, and, and I'm sorry, I don't want to but we're really running short on time, so I appreciate the indulgence. Thank you. And I thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Um, would either of you mind if we submitted some questions, uh, written statements to you later on and get a chance to do some follow-up? We do have additional questions here. We want to be able to do some follow-up, but also want to be able to honor your time. We will be over in the voting time for a while. Either of you have a problem with that? I am sure, Mr. Poole, you will have nothing on your desk when you get there tomorrow. You will be eagerly awaiting these questions. That would be fine. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in that category, could I just ask Mr. Poole if he would uh, give us more detail in writing, because uh, I was intrigued by his answer with respect to the, the, the testimony of Mr. McKee on Uinta County and how BLM was an impediment to their being able economically to develop that land. I'd, I think the subcommittee would welcome more sure. detailed explanation. I'm glad to give you a complete can, profile of that. Great. If I can piggyback on that your be, request. That Thank be you. Terrific. It would be great for both the county and for the committee as we do our research as well. Thank you for being here. We will follow up with additional questions uh, to submit for the record and follow up on that. With that, we are adjourned.